And advanced compute and server solutions are the backbone that supports billions of device, device connections and are based on open standards to help maximize compatibility, scalability, and expandability of our communications networks. How are these uh, new server and storage solutions helping telecommunication companies bring their intellectual property to market faster and ultimately help lower operational expenses, increase profitability, and simplify operations? Joining us today at the Dell TI Now studio at Mobile World Congress 2016 is Ty Schmidt. He's fellow of Extreme Scale Infrastructure Group at Dell, and next to him is Lynn Kopp, Director of Market Development for the Network Platforms Group at Intel. And at the end of the panel is Nabil Batar, Chief Technology Officer of Large Enterprise at Nokia. And panelists, welcome, welcome to the Thank segment. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being here. I mentioned uh, hyperscale clouds in the introduction. I want to talk a little bit further about that. Really extreme scale infrastructures and what's the significance of that. And Ty, I'll start with you. If you can start with sort of a synopsis of what that means, sure. ESI, and also in the climate of big data, um, mobility and cloud computing, how does that apply? Yeah, so yeah, I think it's important to, to start a little bit where, where we came from. So ESI, um, when, when it was created almost 10 years ago, it was really started to address a, a gap in market that, uh, that Dell and others had, and that was addressing this fledgling hyperscale space. Um, companies that were beginning to buy at higher and higher volume and did not value many of the attributes of our general purpose servers. Um, we wanted to go after that market and be able to provide a custom optimized solution for them. So it, it started very much in the, in the single server uh, custom single server quickly began to scale to the rack level, providing rack level, rack level solutions, and then over time that actually grew to large mo mobile containerized solutions as well. But it was all about attaching value and helping facilitate rapid growth, massive growth. These companies uh, you know, were buying thousands of servers a quarter, now they're buying hundreds of thousands of servers a quarter, and they have to simplify and, and streamline every aspect of that, that uh, supply chain, um, manufacturing, integration, uh, deployment, and it's all about reducing the time it takes to get that level of volume from the core manufacturing elements all the way to productive use. Yeah, in fact, uh, as Intel, we tend to be the fabric in many of these deployments as well. And one of the things that we saw early on is that you had to be able to scale things so quickly. And now with things that are more software defined, software defined the infrastructure, the application always used to define the hardware. You know, you'd always set the parameters. The challenge now is you have to have utilization that has been unheard of, you know, 75% utilization, and it has to be on demand. So how do you form what the application needs in the hardware as quickly as the demand is there so that you're responding with the most optimized kind of resource pools for things like big data or mobility or any kind of compute workload? So I, th I think that this is a great point actually because it is really about the physical infrastructure, about how you build the service, the racks and so forth, to, to cater to hyperscale demand, but also the manageability of that right. because you're going to have, as you said, people are ordering hundreds of thousands of servers. Data centers are of that magnitude. So the question now, how do you build software to manage that infrastructure, that means management at scale, automate the management because it's really virtually impossible and practically impossible to manage anything manually, but also to manage the workload creation on the top of that infrastructure, which means how you manage the compute workload that's being created, how you create the networking for that compute workload, how you create the software and software-defined manner. So really it's about all software-defined everything. That's really what it comes down to, to really manage that workload on scale. So it's both the physical infrastructure yeah. to meet requirements, but also the, the software stack, if you will, that goes along with that to and provide for IP. I think it's an important point is, um, you know, what, what we've seen is, is uh, hyperscale space was a, was a leading indicator of where growing industries were, were ultimately going. And, and why did it make sense in the hyperscale space? Not just because of the growth that they were, were needing, were requiring at the, the, the beginning of this. Um, they actually created software layers of resiliency. They, they did things from an application and a, and a resiliency layer standpoint that allowed them to minimize infrastructure and maximize IT deployment, IT volume. And I, you know, I, I see that as a natural segue into the uh, telecommunication space where 
uh, you know, the hyperscale guys figured this out a long time ago. They've actually have been learning, you know, year over year about how to better optimize that. And, and I think now we're at a point, actually we are at a point um, where broader industries, especially the telco industry, can take advantage of that. Right. Whereas okay. five, six, seven, eight years ago, I don't think it was ready, right? So it's taken some maturity to get to the point now where, um, and that's not just hundreds of thousands of servers, how to disaggregate and, and have that type of volume across different, different uh, locations geographically um, and how to better create an optimized solution that takes advantage of, of the density and efficiencies that are afforded to them in that space. Nabil, I wanted to ask you, I'm oh, sorry, did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I want to add to that because I think there is uh, two important points I believe that you raised. One is how the, the application design and the manageability drove right. the, the streamlining of the hardware design. I think that's a point that you tried to make, Ty. And this is very important because the way that people used to build probably things are based on building hardware re resiliency at the core of things. So things used to be built as redundant one-to-one -one or That's redundant right. one plus one. Probably less often it's often redundant one-to-one. -one. And there was a lot of bells and whistles being done around that. I think in the hyperscale environment, things are built in such a way that failures are expected. So the application, the resiliency is built in the application and how you manage things rather than being capitalized on hardware resiliency. So this is really an important thing because yeah. it pulled that resiliency and that expectation of failure back into the application and the management space. So there is application control and management that take care of it. Now on the other side, I do agree. I think also there was a trend being set by the hyperscale companies. And that, that, uh, that I, I guess, trend was set mainly because of need. There was a need to satisfy compute demand, storage demand. Yeah. And it was driven by the application that people use, whether it's for big data uh, analytics or for search engines or whatever. There is tons of data that has to be stored. A lot of transactions that need to be made to, in order to satisfy a request that demanded that compute. And that was coming from really the web scale companies yeah. to a large degree and maybe adopted more and more into, into the larger enterprises that have similar, not at the same scale, but similar demand in terms of transaction, response to transaction yep. and so forth. Everybody has demand for big data analytics, so that's a given, because there is tons of data out there that has to be analyzed, that it has to be harnessed and analyzed uh, for various purposes, whether it's business intelligence, whether it's operational, whether whatever it is. Now, when you start moving that, so who, who leverages that? So obviously the natural thing is that hyperscale will continue to evolve uh, because the demand on it will be more and more as we go further in time. There are many applications that are going to be driving that, but also others are starting to adopt it. So telcos were a bit still stuck maybe at some point in the, in the traditional way that things were built. Probably the last five, six, five years, there has been more kind of loosening, if you will, to adopt compute and I know from the Intel side, I think there was a big push even into that well, to ease the introduction of that. There's no right? way so that you can address the data tsunami with IoT and 50 billion devices being connected without having a complete transformation that is at the kind of scale that these sorts of solutions were intending to solve in a different domain, but there's a need for it in a new Absolutely. domain. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think distributing the data center, I mean, because that's, I think, kind of the gist of this. So yeah, I mean, traditionally, uh, people were, uh, were going and, and the web scale companies, you go from a client to a server, that tended to be much more central, except really for content distribution, where people tended to distribute more and more in co-location spaces and stuff like that. I think in the telco space, there are different demands at the application level because of the type of service that people wanted to do, where probably a much more like so, so centralized uh, uh, infrastructure may not be suitable for the type of workload, the type of uh, SLA expectancy, that, uh, that the yep. provider has and the customer have, so they want to distribute more. But I used to, I mean, in my previous role, I used to be at a service provider, and I used to have the motto to say, centralize as much as you can and dis distribute when you must. And really, the distribution really comes from, from the service need, and that's why it would be done. And I think adopting the similar technologies will be prudent, uh, I think, for the, for the service providers. 
Yeah, I do think that, to your point about distributed and central, that is one of the opportunities and strengths of the service providers because there is going to be a part of the infrastructure that will always be distributed because we all want our small our smartphones to be small. Yeah. We don't want to carry big, huge batteries, so therefore there will be base stations near the users and there will be infrastructure near the users. So it is an opportunity to take advantage of this architecture transformation and be able to be cloud-like everywhere, but take the central and do what it's strongest at and then take the distributed and also Absolutely. leverage that yeah, at the same time. We're actually seeing, the, you know, it's interesting the, the evolution and the, and the change. Um, even in the hyperscale space, we see uh, there is centralized, you know, you look at the large multi-hundred megawatt data centers um, and then there is a need for that. But we're also seeing a growth in distributed uh, you know, data center application where when you're looking at how to get quicker to a given geographic location, a different you know, uh, area of exactly. high populace, and how to do that, but also do that at a higher level of resiliency. These different applications need different layers of resiliency. What we're seeing is there's a trend in quick deployment into a region with multiple smaller stamps being built simultaneously around that populous region, mm -hmm. taking advantage of hyperscale type technology, infrastructure and solutions but being distributed right. in, a, in a given location. And that helps, that helps regionally in places like Europe, it helps even in, yeah. in uh, other locations where you're trying to get quickly to an area and not having to invest, okay, how am I going to build this 20, 40, 60 megawatt facility right. in the next two or three years? No, I can get there quick, I can get there fast, and then I can, I can also adjust my needs as I grow. So yeah. we're seeing a lot of that. I wanted to do, uh, talk about hyperscale environments, hyperscale data centers, and what each of you contribute um, in, that, in that sector, in that realm right now, and have you kind of briefly go through that, but then really uh, apply that to a real life use case maybe that you're um, involved in right now. And, and Ty, I'll start with you. I know that ESI is something you might talk about, RSA um, for you, um, and then uh, of course Nokia, we're excited to hear what you guys are involved in as far as hyperscale uh, data centers. Ty, can you start talking about ESI? Yeah, so, so ESI, um, the, you know, we, we, we tend to say we look at it from the utility pull down and we look at it from the component up, right? So uh, the, the, the two classic examples of, of what we provide are you know, rack level aggregated shared infrastructure solutions, right? We have customers, a lot of customers say, you know, I'm at five, six, 10 kilowatts of rack today. I don't know what 40, 30, 40, 50 kilowatts looks like. How do you get there? Well, one way of getting there is by putting more dense server you know, compute and storage networking elements into a given rack. And that's what we're all about at the rack down layer, right? It's about how to distribute power, cooling, management, all of those elements into, now the rack is the, is the uh, defining factor for that, and then how to most effectively distribute storage networking and, and uh, compute across that array. So that's, that's kind of the rack up element. From the utility pull down, we also do that same, have that same approach from modularity. So we have a very large, growing modular data center business where we look at where is this going to go, what is the resiliency level required, what is the power and cooling required, where is, you know, what, what specific IT elements are going to go into it. Um, important to note that we have to be agnostic. Dell on Dell is better, but we have to be agnostic. So we have to look at all those things, but now instead of a single rack, we're looking at 20, 30, 50, 100 racks at a time being deployed across m modular data centers that have to be built and deployed and in production in a single digit number of months. Yep. Right, that yep. helps facilitate that type of growth. Well, it's interesting because the rack scale architecture was really something that was very collaborative with Dell, and it's a logical hardware architecture as far as we're concerned, and what that really means is there's some basic principles of how you would want to manage it. Things like Redfish, which is a restful way of interacting with the hardware, much easier for everybody in Absolutely. terms of trying to deploy new capabilities, new services, it's not so hard coded. And then on top of that, we have some pod management software that we've been releasing and, and showing as a reference point, not a product, just a reference point for companies to be able to get these on-demand resource pools set up with the rack level management capability as well as the node level management capability. But as far as we work in RackScale, it's a complete collaboration with our partners like Dell because we don't productize it. You know, we're really contributing yep. the ingredients in it. And our goal is let's make it as easy as possible for these ingredients to get consumed at the maximum utilization for any workload. We love Redfish. I mean, we, we actually, 
you know, when we look at, at you know, true DSIM type of applications, you know, now we have you know, modular to rack solutions where from a single pane of glass you can look at every single control monitor uh, specific critical data point within the data center aspect, and you can dial all the way down into the rack into the sub component uh, through Redfish, so it's awesome. It's a yeah. great, great so that, element. This is important, I and mean, that's why we talked about manageability of the data center, right? So I think uh, from that point of view, really, I mean, we, we, do, we do provide different solutions that cater to the, to the hyperscale, but probably the most problem that I want to talk about in the hyperscale uh, data center is really the software-defined networking solution that, uh, that we offer. So we talked about a bit earlier that uh, in, in this type of uh, environment, everything is software defined. That includes networking, right? So whenever we create networking, whenever, whenever we create an application instance or a storage instance, that means whenever we create compute, we create an application on top and associate the storage, you have to provide networking for that. And as you create the compute, you create the storage dynamically, you have to create the network uh, dynamically. And that's really what our Nuage platform it is intended to do, where we look at really defining the network based on the application need. So when you go and define the, the network for the application, you define the policy and the, and the network for that. And then when the compute and the, the instance of the application is created, it gets discovered, and we push, the, I mean, we push down uh, to, the, to the data plane the, the right reachability information and the application policies that needs to be exercised. And that's in support also of multi-tenancy in this type of uh, hyperscale data center. So in doing so, what you do, you define really the, the, the network once for the application, and you instantiate it multiple times at very large scale. And very large scale meaning dynamically as well. Dynamic in terms of uh, how fast you do it, because today, I mean, we didn't talk about that much, but in the data center, there are different software platforms that are, that are being implemented. I mean, we have VMware to start with, then today we have KVM as hypervisor ba based, but we're moving more and more towards container in the DevOps environment today, where dynamicity is, is another factor, uh, another really, uh, if you will, order of magnitude and scale how fast you could create containers. So whenever you create them, you need to really network them at the, at, the, at the right speed, or meaning as fast as you create things, and that's really what, uh, what we cater for from that point of view. Now other things like uh, we're talking about also the distributed uh, telco environment, we obviously cater to that as well in what's called the, the, the network function virtualization space, where we could create uh, the infrastructure, the resource infrastructure. Uh, on the top of that, we could manage the creation uh, of the VNFs or the virtual network functions and the life cycle management of the, those VNFs. These are really the two main dimensions that apply to both the hyperscale data center environment, cloud environment, as well as uh, this new telco environment. Lady so talked about uh, Intel's uh, RSA architecture, but also Redfish as well. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and just give our viewers a, a real life use case of how uh, those technologies or those architectures interrelate? Well, it's interesting because uh, riffing off of where Nabil was going, when you're trying to set up these resource pools really quickly, you'll find things like a big data workload. It's very, very compute intensive and very, very storage intensive, but it's going to do its own work in its own space. Whereas when you're dealing with something like email, it's got a completely different profile. And so what's the real strength of SDN, as well as these hyperscale architectures, is on demand you can make connections between all the different resources across the data center, and you can get the right storage as well as the right compute associated with that workload. And you really can't do that with the leaf spine, the traditional network architectures, where everything is connected to everything. And being able to have this dynamic resource pool that's set up, you're not going to want to tear down your entire hardware pool and power it down and reprovision everything. And you don't have to do that with Redfish. You get this immediate ability to create the resource pool with the right profile connected to the right resources in the data center. And whatever workload is coming in, you can service very effectively. Hyperscale uh, data center demonstrations, maybe this time last year uh, at Mobile World Congress. How far do you think um, that sector has come? Do you think it's moving at a, at a faster pace than even industry's able to keep up with? Well, I would say, if you just look at some of the announcements that happened last year for Hyperscale, and then the fact that what was announced is a product that's being deployed in telecommunications, I mean that, you come out of telco, 
anything happens in under two years, yeah. it's miraculous. So I do think that the pace of innovation is happening very quickly. Um, and then the other thing is most people are realizing these flexible dynamic resource pools aren't necessarily just for 100,000 server deployments. There's a level at which you do want that agility and flexibility across your data center. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think an important part, and Ty probably you touched on that a bit earlier related to this, which is leveraging what came about from the hyperscale environment or the, the large deployment yeah. environment. I think there are multiple factors. Some of them are really uh, maybe driven by the consciousness about the environment, meaning improve the power utilization uh, factor, basically. I mean, that's uh, become more green, as well as satisfy really economic needs, right? Because everybody wants to dial down, if you will, the cost of, uh, of their infrastructure. And that's really what this cater for. So it really addresses both AppX, CapX, cap OpX, as well as the environmental consciousness, if you will, behind this. Yeah, I, as I well. think it's taken. I, I, I think it's taken. You know, five or six years from the hyperscale, you know, beginning of that evolution. If you look at it, it took it took five, six, seven years, um, and now we're at a point where solutions that that are being introduced for the hyperscale market, to your point, are being adopted. Uh, within a matter of months right. in the telco environment. That didn't happen in the first five, six, seven years. You know, it, it took a time. I think part of it's a maturity aspect, both from an application standpoint, also um, from a product standpoint in what is the right solution from a customer standpoint. And the third thing is the customer also has to do their transformation. And I think it's taken, a, taken some time and it's still part of that, that evolution right now where they are in their transformation process of being able to fully take advantage of that type of solution. I expect it's going to, you know, we'll be here next year, uh, and I think we'll be amazed at, at how dramatic the change has happened. Yeah, I, think, I think probably, I mean, the, to take that, to adopt, right, there are multiple things that have to be happening at the back end, that both the environment in which these, these technologies need to be implemented, which yeah. probably were not built for that, as you touched well, yeah, on I mean, that earlier. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you look at uh, traditional telco NEBS, exactly. NEBS type of uh, exactly. environments, right? Well, the reality is today, it's not necessarily that the equipment, the IT equipment has magically become more robust. Um, what's happening is things like the modular data center provide a, a, a good environment, a suitable environment for that IT gear um, without having to use NEBS products. So you're saving yeah. lots of money. You're able to put more, more compute, more IT into a given space uh, without sacrificing efficiency. And you know, a lot of that's being driven by the, the hardware providers expanding their ranges, qualifying at higher temperature and humidity ranges, as well as the overall wrapper that goes around that, being able to provide that environment you know, in these extreme situations. Uh, and there's a strong desire to have the convergence, yeah. to have the converged infrastructure where you can use similar building blocks anywhere through the network, and then you have a similar management construct. Yeah, you, you mentioned case study. You know, I like to think of it, you, know, you look at the journey that, that a given customer has to go through, there's a, the first thing that needs to happen, and in every case, the customer has to internalize and understand their long poles in the tent to, to facilitate their transformation. What are the things limiting me? Logically, physically, what, what are those, those people? People, it's process. always people, right? The problem's never technology, exactly. it's always so the people. Right. Right? It's so skill set, right? That's, that's right, right. that's right. So once that's been identified and aligned, now they can begin to break down the walls and, and look at, you know, various forms of solutions in, in, right, across absolutely. the board, so. Uh, just real quickly to wrap up, I want to uh, find out from Nabil at the Nokia booth and for our viewers um, that will be able to watch this later today or tomorrow, is there a hyperscale hyper data center demonstration in your booth this time around? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. There could be, and if I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not aware. Lynn? Yes, we have a, two demos that are showing some hyperscale deployments. Ty? Yes, we've got a rack level our architecture, and we have a modular data center um, presentation as well, so kind of hit him for both ends. Good to know. Yeah. Nabil, uh, nice to meet you, by the way, and uh, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, I know you're going through a transition right now at the company, and yeah, I'm sure that's a, a, comp a corporate transition, but also a personal it's transition. A corporate and cultural transition. Uh, there you go, good. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, Lynn, it was thank nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Oh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ty. Thanks, uh, of My course. Pleasure. Well, first of all, thanks for supporting us. It's the Dell TINL studio, yep. and uh, we've been had a chance to, uh, I've seen you walking around the booth, didn't realize who you were, so now I do. Thanks, uh, thanks for your time, yeah, appreciate it. And for all of our continued programming here at Mobile World Congress 2016, you can go to tinow.org, and for social media, you can follow us on Twitter at TIA underscore now. So long.